Good morning and welcome to a warm family filled with so much love and embrace. We are glad that you are here. We hope to touch your life and change your tomorrow. If you're joining us for the first time today or you've recently joined us, we would love to connect with you. We would love to get to know you a little bit more. So please do sign up for our guest Zoom lounge, which will take place next week Sunday at 10 a.m. So you've got the rest of the week to sign up for that. You can do that by scanning the QR code or simply following the link that is going to appear on the screen. And now let us prepare our hearts for the service as I hand over to Auntie Regina, who's going to encourage us as we give this morning. Good morning, family. I trust God Almighty has been taking care of you, watching over you, because indeed He is a faithful God. Life has been a roller coaster since the beginning of the year for everyone. It has been one calamity after another. Just when you think you've landed, you are hit hard again. A family member loses a job, another one gets sick, could be death in the family. You thought maybe if we could get to level two of the lockdown, you get your job back or the business will improve. Try teaching a group of students behind a mask. That is very difficult. You want to visit your loved one, but you cannot because the borders are still closed. The debts you thought would be paid by September, as the economist had promised, are still glaring at you. All these things can make us wary as children of God. But this morning, the offering message is encouraging us in this way. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, it reads thus, Let us not become wary in doing good, for at the proper time we we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those that belong to the family of believers. Last week, Mr. Valempini also encouraged us from Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, that whatsoever we do, we are doing it to Christ. How then do we keep on doing good without getting weary? The answer lies in the one who knows us the one who understands us, the one who created us, and this is our God. In Isaiah 40, 28, the word of God says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. In Isaiah 40, 29, it says, He gives us strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even the youth grow tired and weary. The young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Family, let us continue to give in the house of the Lord. Help those around us, whether it be moral, material, or physical support. The Lord is faithful. He will continue to give us the opportunity and the strength to run this race that he has set before us. Amen. Ladies, please join us this coming Sunday, the 13th of September at 3 p.m. for our very first ladies' Zoom meeting. We have not seen each other in a long time, and this will be a great time of connection and fellowship. Scan the QR code on the screen for the Zoom link, and you will also receive it on WhatsApp. If you are unable to connect with us via Zoom, please do let us know on the church WhatsApp number. We will make alternative arrangements to connect with you. We can't wait to see you.
Good morning, family. We, we are going to go into the Word of God again this morning. And um, before we get into that, I would like us to take a moment and spend some time in prayer. Let us do that. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that, Father, you are our God. We thank you that you are a great Redeemer. You are the one that has called us, and you are the one, Father, that keep us in your presence. You are the one that keep us in holiness. You are the one, Father God, that enable us to be who you want us to be. And Father, as we go through the word today, it is our prayer that, Lord God, your word shall be actualized in our hearts. Your word shall be actualized in our lives. So that, Father, in everything that we do, Christ shall be glorified. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We pray that, Lord God, Christ shall indeed be lifted up and that, Father, Christ shall be seen by those who see us as we live for Christ. And, Father, even as we die for Christ in all the different situations in our lives. We pray to you, Father, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, family, I, I, I hope you notice that last Sunday, our Palesa dwelt on the book of Philippians, although she traversed the scriptures. And she spoke about the fact that for us to be accepted by other people, um, it looks like we need to have good deeds. She also spoke about being judged or treated based on our responses to some, to, you know, things like our personal achievements that we may have made during our lifetime. We heard how unimportant humans are because we are programmed to value one another in terms of material success. We even do the same thing with our children and our friends and also with our neighbors and relatives. We are bound or we are impressed by titles and worldly achievements and statuses. Maybe I should also indicate that I'm also going to be speaking from the same book that Aus Palesa spoke about, that is the book of Philippians. Um, if you check in this book, you know, the book of Philippians, you will realize that it is a very positive writing because Paul is not complaining in this book. And it, you realize that it is a book where Paul actually talks positively throughout the book, except two verses or so where he reprimands some two people who had some conflict. And the people who were in conflict were not actually members of the church, but they actually were part of his preaching team. Look, the church of Philippians was a great church to lead. It was an ideal church as it was a benevolent church and was very appreciative. It was not a good time to be living in, specifically for Paul, because of the persecutions that were going on, but the believers there were very strong. If you look at Acts chapter 16, verses 20 to 40, you will realize or you will learn that the church was started, you know, this church in Philippi was started in Lydia's house and grew with Paul's jailer. You know, okay, maybe let me indicate this. Paul was actually in jail when he wrote to the Philippians. Now, his jailer and his family also became part of the nucleus of this church in Philippi. Family, um, the book of Philippians is one of the books of the Bible that have, have a lot of what I would call life mottos or life motto verses that get taken out of context. Think about all these verses that come from the book of Philippians. For example, do not be anxious about anything. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Rejoice in the Lord always. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, there are several others that, that one can look at. However, anyway, um, Philippians is full of these kinds of verses. Maybe I should ask you today to memorize one of these verses today because um, it is in a, the passage that I would like to focus on. Philippians 1.21 says, To live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to say it twice, and I'm going to invite you to say it with me, wherever you are. Please repeat after me. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
There we go. Now, one commenta commentator states that uh, Philippians is a spiritual love letter to the church, filled with affection and gratitude. As I said, it was not an easy time for Paul because he was in prison. But the emphasis of the prisoner in this epistle is victory and joy. Paul was more focused on the work of Christ than himself. Maybe you're also one of those people that have this verse as your life motto. Well, that's okay. You know, for Paul, this motto was a different ball game. He was going to stand trial and he knew that he could be executed for his faith in Christ. Paul was going to stand trial before Emperor Nero so he could give evidence pertaining to the charges he was facing. And Nero was not an easy guy, eh? he was not an easy ruler. History has it that he had killed his mother, he had kid, killed his first two wives and several other people. So who was Paul to him anyway? I mean, if anything at all, Paul was nothing to Nero. Anyway, we are not here to talk about Nero, but we are here about Paul who speaks about Christ. For Paul, the words, to live is Christ and to die is gain, were very literal because he was probably going to face death when he met up with Nero. Now, church, Paul was addressing a diligent group of believers and was encouraging them to be faithful. He was talking about their faithfulness and also warning them about those who were preaching Christ for personal gain. And he says he is just fine with that too, you know, even when people preach Christ for personal gain, because Christ is preached anyway. This incident happens when Paul is on, a tri is on trial for the faith. And his life is put even in more danger because of the apostates, that is, the liars and fake teachers who were spreading lies about his preaching. I wouldn't be happy about this if I was Paul. But Paul states he's okay with it. He's just fine with it. You know, uh, he rejoices just because Christ is preached. Hey, Mina, I would try very hard to prove those fellows wrong so that maybe my case would be thrown out, even if on a technicality. Now, maybe let us go into the scriptures themselves. Now, Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22 um, says, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I, I, church, I've tried to understand what Paul meant when he said he hopes not to be ashamed. And, was, and as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, which reminds us that we should never be ashamed of even suffering for the gospel of Jesus. Well, how often have you had to make the choice of being honorable to the Lord and losing worldly material? There are instances where you have to choose between yourself and honoring Christ. And I hope you know what the right choice is. Well, you know, some believers have had to make choices and have stood firm in the faith because they have ingrained it in their minds that it is better or it was better to suffer affliction with the children of God. I'm tempted to go into the book of Daniel and talk about Daniel, but that will, be for an, that will be for another day. Maybe let me give a few examples of where believers have had to make choices. You know, I'm saying believers because I'm speaking to believers. I must tell you, there are other people who are not even believers who also have to make these choices. Let me address myself to women. As a woman, having to face the situation where you are asked to extend favors to a man so that you could advance in your career, as a man, haven't you been coaxed by your seniors at work or partners in business to indulge in that which is dishonoring of you, your spouse, if, that is, if you, are if you are married, and more so, you know, which would be dishonoring of the Lord so that you could fit in with the gang or fit in with the group? As a young person, 
I guess you are faced with these challenges on a daily basis, and we call this peer pressure. The question I ask is, do you choose to have your entire being honoring of the Lord or other interests? The question again, do you choose to honor the Lord or do you choose to honor your other interests? Maybe let me be a bit allegoric in my expression of, of this concept of life and death. You know, I could equate life to what many people call life, in quotes, these days. I've had people say that they are living their life. But, they, but what they mean is, is that, you know, um, they are so much indulging in that which is leading to death, but they do not mind because, as they say, I've heard this from my daughter, Yolo, which means you only live once. They say, you know, you know th they see this kind of kamikaze approach as life. I mean, really? On the other hand, when things are not going as we wish, we see that as dreary, and we say that we are not alive. Are we then saying we are dead? So we as believers are saying we are successful in life in a manner that is honoring to the Lord. We are excited about that. On the other hand, if we are not as successful because we are honorable to the Lord, we are excited about that too. You know, there are instances where we lose out on worldly or on other things that are not necessarily seen but are of the world because we are honoring or are being honorable to the Lord. You know, I've, I've, had, a, I've had scholars compare um, the body to anything that is corruptible. That is, those things that will come to an end. Paul recognizes that the body will come to an end and in, in some or other way. And he is saying, Whichever way it happens, Christ should be glorified. In my body, Christ must be glorified. If I die, Christ must be glorified. If I live, Christ must be glorified. Maybe I should take some time, you know, to unpack verse 21. You know, the verse that says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Up to this time, Paul has already suffered much in his missionary journeys. Um, you know, if you've had the opportunity to read the book of Acts, you will know that he had been beaten, he had been stoned, he had been, he, you know, he was hated and he was derided, he had been shipwrecked, and now, as he's writing, he is in prison. But Paul found joy in his affliction because these afflictions had strengthened his faith exponentially and allowed him to serve as a strong witness for Christ. Family, preaching and living out the word of God was Paul's highest goal. And these events, had, these events had actually provided him with ample opportunities for evangelism. He had done what he was asking the Romans to do in Romans 12 verse 1, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. To live is Christ could mean that whatever we do as believers should bring glory to Christ. As a wife or a husband or a child or an employer or an employee, we should in every way bring glory to Christ. As Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. To live is Christ should mean that whatever we do is fruitful labor that magnifies Christ. You know, our presence amongst believers should make it easy for them to live a life that honors Christ. I, I read a commentary that says something like, like this. A great way of expressing the to live is Christ text is when people are finding joy and are able to boast or glory in Christ by us being alive. I would even boldly argue that God is most glorified in us when we are the most satisfied in him. Also, 
I read another quote which says, Christ is most magnified when we are most satisfied in him, whether in life or by death. Well, there is a topic that we talk very little about these days, and this is the topic of heaven. You know, Paul, having gone through so much bodily torment, he was still willing to live on. I guess it was not because he was afraid of death, but because he wanted to share Christ even more. By saying to die is gain, I don't think he was saying he wants to die. I think he was reminding the church that even if he were to die, he was going to gain something much greater, being in the presence of the Father. It meant that he would then go to heaven and be with the Father. This, I mean heaven, is something that he taught and which Christ also spoke a lot about. But we say very little about, this, about it these days, you know. Um, it sounds crazy when people, you know, um, to people when we say, we say to die is gain. But when we understand what it means, we would be willing to walk that road. I'm trying very hard not to, to get tempted to talk about the presence of their father because a lot happens there. And, you know, the presence of the father means us being in heaven or being with the father. But anyway, when we're in the presence of the father, prayers are heard. When we're in the presence of the father, Christ is glorified. And we know that in the presence of the father, Christ went to be there after he conquered sin and death. And the presence of the Father also means God hears us when we are in his presence. And also, in the presence of the Father, we won't need to do a lot of other things at all. Let me not digress because of my excitement about this topic of heaven. This is a topic for another day. Anyway, let me just remind you that dying is not an end for us as believers because we know there is a life that awaits us with the Father. It is in fact the beginning of a brighter life with the Father for eternity. I really would like to ask you the same question that Paul is grappling with. Live or die? Live or die? Which is better for you? Well, I hope you don't want to die because you have too much stress in the world and you think it would be better to die, rather to have death as an escape route. Well, when you go to the book of Philippians, uh, the seventh chapter, sorry, the third chapter, verses seven and eight, we read this. But what things were gained to me? Now, this is Paul speaking. Paul, who was in prison, Paul, who was being tortured, he says in verses seven and eight, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Family, being in Christ is itself much gain because we are able or should at least be willing to, to let go of things that would be an offense in our glorious walk with Christ. It means we are able to downgrade things that others elevate when we're in Christ. It means we are able to know what truly matters and what does not. It means we know that material loss is temporal or temporary, but our greater gain in the Father is eternal. As we wrap up, let us be able to differentiate chaff from the real thing. Let us know that what we have in Christ is, it, is eternal. John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 verse 12, tells us he's winnowing. Now, he's talking about Christ. John the Baptist says his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor 
and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with the unquenchable fire. Let us choose Christ to live for. So that when it is time for us to depart, we are able to say, just like Paul said, to die is gain. Family, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. May we be willing to live for Christ and may we also be prepared to die for Christ. The Lord bless you. Father, we come before you. We want to thank you that, Lord, you grant us courage to, to live for you. And, Father, it is our prayer that, Lord, as we live our lives, enable us, grant us indeed continually this courage to live for you. And, Father, also enable us, give us the strength, give us the grace to be able to say, die for Christ is with it. Give us the ability within our hearts, within our souls, and Father in everything, to be able to say we would rather suffer affliction with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, as Daniel said, when Father he had to choose the niceties of the world and abandon you. Father, enable us to be who you want us to be so that Christ shall be glorified. May we, Father, die so that Christ is lifted up in our lives. We pray to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come to the end of our service. Today we are greatly reminded of how we should be absent from the body and present in the Lord. For to live as Christ and to die is gain. May we always live to honor and glorify God. Remember, if you're new, to sign up for our guest lounge meeting taking place next week, Sunday at 10 a.m. And to the ladies, we'll see you at 3 p.m. for our Zoom meeting. To everyone else, enjoy your Sunday and the rest of the week.